uh, the pleasure of introducing Richard Heath. Richard has a background in practical farming, a little in plains in North West New South Wales. Managed cropping operations of large family business for nearly two decades and grew wheat, barley, chickpeas, beans, canola, sorghum, sunflowers, mung beans and cotton. So pretty varied. Richard has been an early adopter of new farming technologies and travelled on a Duffield scholarship in 2003 researching precision applications of fertiliser. He has had an extensive off-farm consulting roles, including working with the group GRDC, advising on research priorities for Australian grain growers. Recently, uh, he's held an academic position with the University of Sydney as Associate Professor of Agronomy and Farm Management, responsible for the management of the University's Northwest Farms Group. Currently, though, he holds a position General Manager of Research for the Australian Farm Institute, where he is responsible for carrying out research projects and compiling reports on a range of farm and agriculture related issues. He's also, at the moment, the Director of the Nuffield Farming Scholars Australia. His topic, uh, title presentation, The Future of Agronomy, uh, Technology and Science that Will Drive our yield for the next decade. And uh, he's uh, recently been in the US and only uh, just made it back in time with a few plane delays. So thanks, Richard. <laughs>
Uh, it's exactly the same technology, but it's, I would be coming convinced that it's, it's serving a whole lot of purposes. And anyway, I'll, I'll expand on that as I, I, get, I go through the talk. But I'd like to sort of for you to think about that a little bit as I'm, as I'm going through. So I'm going to start with um, an example of a company that I think really encapsulates how uh, digital has been evolving and um, the environment has been changing in recent years. This is a company called Machinery Link. Uh, has anyone heard of it in the US? So their core business uh, up until very recently was uh, renting combine harvesters. Uh, so they rented about 300 or so uh, combine harvesters, uh, basically machinery gear yeah, like rent up. Um, they, and uh, just recently, just a couple of years ago, they spun off another company which is now their main business. This is what they look like now. <coughs> the main business is called Farm Link. They still have machinery link, they still rent combines, uh, but their, their main business looks like that. Now that's very different looking to uh, a machinery rental company, isn't it? And when you go further into uh, the website about how they describe themselves, it's a bit hard to see that it's a bit small. Uh, but it basically says, we're a data science and technology company. So within the space of two years, they moved from being, uh, from renting machinery to being a data science and technology company. Now, how did they do that? What they realised is, with those 300 headers that they had running around the country, because you, know, you can't buy a header these days without your monitor in it, they were collecting an enormous amount of data about the crops that were growing in the US, from one side of the US to the other. And they started to think about the value of that data. Uh, they designed some <coughs> software, you know, someone designed the software for them, uh, which was very good at uh, the calibration progress and, and standardising it also became very good quality data. Um, and they started to sell that um, and realised that it was a really valuable asset. And that has now become uh, the, their core business. That's their value proposition, that's their value driver in their business is the data they're getting from the machines rather than the machines themselves. So I think that really you know, it encapsulates the change of thinking and the change of understanding about where uh, value is starting to shift um, in service division in agriculture. So one of the, uh, the conferences I went to um, in the States is called InfoAg. Uh, it's a, a really big precision ag uh, slash digital agriculture conference that's held every year. This is the third time I've been here, and it's been really interesting to see how over that time it's, it's provided a really good snapshot of what the technology of the day has been and how it's been developing and what the hype is and um, you know, sort of what, what's coming up next. Uh, the first time I went eight years ago, uh, so this picture is of the trade hall um, in the conference. Um, it's at something like 1,800 delegates. It's a really big conference. It's got, um, I think there was 70 or 80 uh, exhibitors there. Um, the, the first time I went eight, time, eight years ago, most of the exhibitors in the hall were about variable weight technologies. So variable weight planters, variable weight sprayers. Uh, three years ago, uh, if you didn't have a drone on your display, then no one was going to talk to you. It was all about drones and all about the hype around drones. This year, at least 50% of uh, the people in that hall had some sort of material or signage or product that called themselves, that branded themselves a data science company, a data analytics company, insights into data, something about data. It was just data, data, data. Everything, everyone there was selling a product that did something with data in some way. And there were some really interesting companies there. Not, there's not the, you know, the John Deere's, the Agco's. There were Silicon Valley startups um, that had very lag main knowledge when you started to talk to them when you got past the first couple of paragraphs of their pitch. Um, they really knew very little about agriculture. They just knew that it was an exciting space to be in and there was money to be made and it's all about data and we know data. Um, so uh, there's an enormous amount of hype uh, about data at the moment. Um, another example of just how much activity there is and, and, and what's happening in the marketplace. This is a company called Agtech, which 
facilitates contact between um, farmers, investors, and our tech companies to try and form relationships and get investments happening. I think it's a bit hard to see, but you'll get the general impression. This is their map of the companies that they deal with. So this isn't everyone in the space, this is just who they deal with working in ad tech at the moment uh, in the US. An enormous amount of activity. But I've used the word hype a few times. So who's seen this hype curve? <laughs> Innovation trigger, you know, it's when people first started thinking about things and, and what the potential is. And as a result of that, you get this peak of inflated expectations. Oh, it's all wonderful. It's, you know, we do these amazing things that's going to solve the world. And then reality sets in. You go through a crop of disillusionment about, well, actually, it's really not going to do quite as much as we thought. Then you learn, you learn to use the technology a bit more. You're on a slope of enlightenment. And then eventually you reach a, uh, a kind of productivity. Now, this was a slide that was uh, put up uh, in Monsanto presentation at Info8, and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm broken, they've got a lot of that pretty much right. When you look at, you know, right on the, on the right-hand side there with things like what I see here and, and soil sampling and DBI, you know, that, that we know what to do with that now. We're sort of pretty comfortable with those technologies that develop pretty well. But then when you go right down to the left-hand side, uh, there's some really interesting stuff there. Uh, and I'm going to sort of talk a bit more about that now with some of the products that are um, starting to appear in the States and how they're interacting. Now, across all of that, just relating it back to a you and know, how it's actually going to uh, inform the way that we do things on the farm. It, you know, I mean, there is something that's, that's missing on that curve, and that's just you know, the agronomy inside, how, how we actually use any of those tools to make decisions about how we farm. And I think it, you know, I think agronomy insight runs all the way across that curve. We, we use bits and pieces from all of those technologies to build knowledge and, and make decisions about what we do. Um, so the first example I'm going to talk about is the Farmers Business Network. Has anyone heard of Farmers Business Network? A pretty new US company, raising an awful lot of interest. Um, when I was over there. Um, they are all about maximising the value of capturing data. Uh, it's, it's very loosely a data cooperative. Um, you pay $500 a year to subscribe to their service and you just give them as much data as you can. So all your yield data, your planting maps, whatever you want to give them, they've got a, um, you know, a, a, a platform that, that, that uh, you, you put the data into. And then what you get back from them in return uh, is this sort of stuff. So you get, it's, it's essentially a benchmarking service. So it, it, it compiles all that data that all these farmers are putting, analyzes it all, and then puts it back in the forms of graphs or things like what varieties perform best on what soil type, what planting rate gave the best yield, what crop protection package gave the best yield. Uh, and then interestingly, and this is the bit that's really uh, potentially disruptive, what everyone paid for their inputs, who got the best prices, where were the best prices obtained from, um, and so on and so on. Now that bit there, so there's, this is this is where I sort of started to think and about, uh, you know, at, at first glance, and it's it's, it's a grind of information. You, you're going to get what was the best variety that might make it change the decision on, on what you should be growing, what plant you should be growing at. But where I think potentially the greater value is, and uh, where they've actually been, what what's what the the critical factor was for them in getting, they've just got another $20 million in venture capital funding from Google Ventures. And uh, there's a few people that told me that what got Google over the line in funding them was the input side of things. Uh, and that knowledge about what people are paying for inputs, where the, where the inputs are going, and how they're using the inputs. And the one map, or the one piece of information that got Google over the line was a map that they produced predicting a pest outbreak in canola in Canada. 
and they were able to do that just by looking at where the canola had been grown, what varieties had been grown, what the resistance of rating of all those varieties were, and then correlating that to previous year's history, uh, looking at then what the pest outbreaks had been, putting a bit of weather forecasting over the top of it, and going, well, we think there's going to be a pest outbreak here. Having that sort of information then at their disposal, what they've done is they've got into retailing the inputs. So they've then gone to uh, the manufacturers directly and said, well, we, you know, we want this much product, and then they've offered that directly to the subscribers of Farmers Business Network. So they've bypassed the, um, the input retail. Now that's, you know, that's an Amazon of crop inputs, an Alibaba of, of crop inputs. Uh, and that is a really disruptive, potentially, uh, development. Uh, and you know, I think possibly, quite possibly, uh, bigger implications on profitability than the actual economic information that you're getting out of it. Uh, I think that you know, one of the things that really made me think about the, the, the potential for improvement just on the logistics side of things and uh, you know, controlling how you get inputs to where they need to be and controlling the price and all that sort of stuff. Um, I read an article recently about UPS, uh, the postal, the parcel delivery service. Uh, they ran um, a program or, or worked out, developed an algorithm to run across their routing software for all their drivers that minimised the amount of uh, left-hand turns that they did, it'd be right-hand turns in this country, so sort of turning across the traffic, basically. Just by doing that and, and minimising the amount of left-hand turns they did, they saved $300 million a year in fuel. Now, you know, agriculture is a logistics business at the end of the day. Uh, it's about getting the right product to the right place at the right time and then delivering the right product to the right place at the right time. And I don't think that we've even really started to uh, approach looking at the data that we're collecting, potentially collecting in terms of really analysing the logistics efficiency possibility and understanding that data. Um, this business network is starting to do that and they're getting a lot of investment as a result and a lot of interest. So as I said, they're a data cooperative and they work because farmers are prepared to share data. The more data they've got in there, the more that it's going to work. Now, I know that uh, a lot of people all over the world, here, the US, everywhere, are quite nervous about sharing data. Now, particularly when it's just within um, a, you know, a one commercial entity um, and they're not very transparent about what they're going to do with that data, where it's going, who's going to get the value from it. You know. Um, there's some really interesting uh, developments happening in the States that are trying to get around that issue, that are trying to create uh, platforms or create groups that give some confidence and some trust in sharing data. The Ag Data Coalition has only been in existence for five months. Um, it's a partnership between a couple of the big machinery brands, a whole lot of land grant universities, and the American Farm Bureau. Again, it's, it's essentially a data cooperative. Uh, they've developed a platform uh, that you can, it's essentially a data bucket. You just put your, all your data in there. Um, but what it does is it, is it then facilitates the movement of that data to wherever you want it to go. So it doesn't exclude you from being on my job of the year or you know, whatever platform you might be. But you can go through Ag Data Coalition to do it. So it's just as simple then as ticking the box saying, I want my data to go here, or I want my data to go there, or I want my data to go to my agronomist, or a university for research, or whatever it is. But the data is held by the Ag Data Coalition. And if you fall out of love with the product that you're, you know, the other product that you're using, or it goes broke, or the research finishes, or whatever, it's still in that bucket with the Ag Data Coalition. You haven't lost it, you can send it somewhere else. Um, I think conceptually that's quite attractive. Um, I think they've got some, I think they're still trying to work out their business model in terms of how that's actually going to be paid for and how it's going to work. But it's this communication of, uh, the sorts of, of 
um, uh, organisations, I guess, that are developing, realising that having trust around sharing data and uh, having uh, a process of sharing data that farmers are comfortable with and can trust is going to be essential um, for a lot of these, these things to really work. Um, another one that's just started, um, very similar, uh, growers' information uh, services, I think, cooperative, yeah, grower, grower information services cooperative. Again, group of farmers basically getting together, deciding, realising that at an individual farm level, their data really isn't going to have that much value to anyone else. But at an aggregated level, they can really start to monetize that. Um, and so, uh, you know, same thing, just collecting a lot of data together and then providing that as an aggregated product to marketing companies, to researchers, to whoever it might be. Um, one of the things I think that's really poorly understood at the moment, and I'll talk a little bit later about a project that's just over here in Australia that hopefully might start to do some work on this, is that if you're a really, really, really big company like AUBS, um, or I spoke to one big uh, ad company um, you know, producer uh, in the States, I was over there that had 3,000 employees, a um, huge mega, mega um, uh, farming corporation. There is a point where sharing your value, sharing your data, uh, is you know, not a good idea that, that you, by retaining the data in your organisation, um, developing um, tailored products around that is going to give you a competitive advantage against the other big organisations that you're competing with. Um, at some point between that and the single operator family farm, there's a point where it crosses over where you, you're never going to get the value out of holding your data, even that it's obviously a lot better to share it and get an industry insight or a um, contributor to research that's going to help your organisation, your business grow. I don't think we understand where that point is yet. I'm, well, I know that there really hasn't been that sort of economic research done in trying to really um, uh, understand the value proposition of data, where it lies, um, where the point is uh, you know, defining where it's, when it's better to share rather than keep it in your own business. And you know, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm hoping that that work will be done soon. And I think that will really start to inform, even further inform, um, as farmers, the sorts of organisations that we should be looking for, the sorts of products that we should be looking for uh, to handle data that's going to give us um, the most, you know, provide the most potential to get uh, economic value out of data. So if we go back to the, the, um, uh, the hype curve, so that's you know, really, if you look down there on the left, Amazon for inputs, um, you know, still in the, in the innovation tree on its way up. So I think that's an example there of but potentially uh, with Farmers Business Network, uh, where that sort of product is starting to evolve. Um, another one there that's sort of right at the top of the peak of inflated expectations at the moment is the Internet of Things um, in agriculture. Um, parrot. A few of you might have seen the little parrot drones and toys and things that you can get now. They also make you know, sensors, internet of things sensors. So that's one that you stick in your pocket and uh, you wirelessly communicate, you know, hooks into your Wi Fi network and then uh, sends a message to the app on your phone and your pop plant and it's water. <laughs> now, you know, <laughs> how long? All right, we can see that. Oh, yeah, it's a bit gimmicky and uh, a bit of a laugh. How long before we got one of that for a good I mean, probably not realistically, but, you know, that's the potential. Now, there are already glass houses, and, and significantly sized glass houses, where every plant in the glass house has an IP address. Right? So, the Internet of Things is real. Um, it is happening. It's just trying to work out, you know, it is probably at the peak inflated expectations at the moment. Um, but it, it's it's beyond proof of concept, it's there. It's just working out the economics of, of how it's actually going to impact on broad acre um, agriculture. Um, this is a company, is anyone, who's heard of the yield? Anyone heard of the yield? Um, so this is an Australian company um, that's uh, relatively new. Um, they are based in Sydney and in Hobart. 
they uh, worked at another organisation called the Knowledge Economy Institute, which is an Internet of Things Institute out of the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, this company has been spun off from a technology project that was uh, funded by the University of Tasmania and the Tasmanian government, um, producing that produced, and it is commercial now, um, an Internet of Things product for the oyster industry. So they developed tiny little sensors that are embedded in the oysters that actually measure the respiration rate um, of the oyster. It's all hooked up to the internet. Um, and then they combine that with weather sensors and uh, water quality sensors on streams and things upriver from the, the oyster beds. And by combining all that data, what they were able to do was by because when the, the oyster's under stress, when there's pollutants in the water, the respiration rate changes, and they could correlate that to rainfall events and weather events and water quality and things upstream. Mm -hmm. So they were able to very reliably model and predict after a rainfall event how long it would be before they had to shut down the, the oyster harvesting. Now previous to that, there was just, it was very, um, very empirical that they just said, well it's raining, you know, we'll shut down the oyster I was in for a week, sort of thing, you know, just guesswork, pretty much. Um, but with this system in place, they were able to halve the number of days that the, the um, oyster harvesting was shut down. So it had really significant productivity improvements for the, for the oyster industry. So it's a real life commercial example of the internet things working in agriculture. Um, I don't think it's too long before we're going to start seeing that, uh, that sort of approach where we've got little small micro sensors whether they are measuring things like sap flow or, or photosynthetic rate or gas exchange whatever it is in crop plants um it's all moisture levels um and then you know combining that with broader weather data uh to much more uh reliably inform crop models so at the moment crop models are based on historical observations, lots of years of observations and data, and then you look at that compared to a current weather pattern and going, well, this has happened in the past, the weather patterns is this year, so it probably means that this is going to happen this year. Um, what the Internet of Things will enable is a, a real-time validation and of that data, saying, well, we actually know for certain that the plant at this time is photosynthesising at 80% of its optimum rate. How does that correlate with the model and what the model is saying that should be done? So, um, you know, I, I think there's some really significant advancements about to happen uh, with the Internet of Things and, and crop modelling. Um, the thing I just want to point out about this slide as well, with the yield, look at their partners, Bosch, Intel, Microsoft. Right? Again, the investment, the interest, the activity in ag tech at the moment uh, and, and this is why I sort of, when I talk about that, I about how significant a change it is at the moment. Um, these are people that haven't been in agriculture before. These are, you know, obviously really significant global technology companies that are looking to be in agriculture. I think it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So, just back to the, the innovation hype curve. Um, as I said before, I think that the uh, agronomy insight sort of runs across all of that with a whole lot of things. And I'll just talk quite, you know, quite briefly about some of the more sort of traditional understanding of, what, of the agronomic aspect of digital agriculture and how it's going to look. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you be really, you know, quite familiar with this um, already. But it, it's basically about you know, the digitising crop production is about Get as much information as you can from a whole lot of different sources, layering it all together, and then coming up with an algorithm that understands all of those layers and and is able to make some sort of prediction out of it. So that by looking at soil type, the fertiliser you put on, what you planted there, the rate that you planted it, when you planted it, and combining that with a bit of weather prediction that you need this much more fertiliser or you can expect this much yield. Now, there's a lot of products that are um, 
taking that approach now to you know, in, in really nice, new, uh, fancy user interface type products. This is Field View, which is a Climate Corp product. Um, Climate Corp, the, the purchase of Climate Corp by Monsanto a few years ago for $1 billion was the start of, I guess, the, the hype cycle in, in data, in agriculture. It was the purchase that really made sort of the, the corporate world look up and take notice of the value that certain people were, were placing on data in agriculture. Um, so they're doing, you know, if you, if you think of that last uh, slide that I put up, they're basically just collecting a whole lot of data from different sources into the cloud, combining it all, and then providing uh, a planting prescription or a fertilizer prescription or something like that. Now they've had, uh, I think there's, and I'll put the, the field view example up um, to talk about specifically for an element that is still going to be really, really important to make all this work. Uh, Monsanto's a pretty arrogant company, really, when it comes down to it. And when they first uh, put this product out, it was a very Monsanto-like product in that all they did was basically you put all your data in and then you got a seed prescription back. And there was very, it was a real black box sort of thing. There was very little explanation of how it had happened, um, you know, what the process had been to come up with that seed prescription, um, any transparency in the algorithm or anything like that. And farmers rejected it, rightly so. Uh, it was very poor uptake, um, they, they sort of pushed it for a couple of years and then realised, well hang on, we've got to change our strategy. And now, um, you still can get the seed and prescription, but you can also get a lot more. You can just choose to get fertiliser, you can just choose to get seed, you can get the whole package, it's more open, you can, you know, they explain the process a lot more and they realise that building that trust relationship is still really, really important that it has to be more than just putting data in and getting, you know, the data says, well, you should do this. I mean, no, of course you're not going to trust that. You, you have to actually understand it's like the trust relationship you have with, with your agronomist. You know, you, you have to have some belief in uh, how it's coming about, you know, the recommendation. Um, drones. So if you remember drones, was at the, the peak of the, um, uh, the, the inflated expectation um, curve at the moment. Um, so that's when I was at the University of Sydney uh, managing some of the research farms. Uh, that was um, some NDBI imagery taken by a drone of a whole lot of small plot breeding trials. So each one of those little coloured squares is two metres by four metres, and there are a whole lot of different um, trials uh, all combined together. Now, for that purpose, yeah, drones are wonderful. Uh, you know, for that detail of, of input information, it's a very great research tool. But that took probably a week to put that together. And that's what, three hectares in there? <laughs> so, really, when you're talking about tens of thousands of hectares, and are you ever going to manage tens of thousands of hectares at a two by four metre scale? Probably not. Um, I think there's a lot of inflated expectations, as the hyper shows, about what the potential of drones are and what they're actually going to be used for. Great tool for intensive agriculture, great tool for research, and probably a great tool to acquire some of the information I was talking about before in terms of that Internet of Things type approach where you get some very specific data to calibrate a model or something like that and you know where you go and get the information from and specific, like you, you've got four soil types on your farm, so you do a targeted drone flight over the four soil types to get some really specific information or something like that. But as a tool that's going to be run over a whole farm at the scale that you guys are operating, um, I just can't see that they're ever going to be uh, economically viable um, or you know, economically more useful than satellite imagery or something like that that's going to be much more appropriate for the, for the scale that you're operating at. Um, now, there's a really interesting one down there, uh, blockchain-based grain trading. 
Anyone know what blockchain is? Just heard of Bitcoin, the internet currency or the digital currency. So blockchain is the technology that enabled Bitcoin. Um, now I'm glad none of you have heard of it, but I can make something up now because I don't really understand it either. <laughs> it's basically, as, as far as I understand it, uh, a whole lot of linked databases that work simultaneously. So that when you, uh, and it works really well for a digital currency like um, Bitcoin, so that it's not held on one central database, like the old concept, you know, you go to the bank and put the money in the bank, it's held in one place, you know, in your branch or something like that. These, these are distributed databases all over the world that are instantaneously linked. Now, we're getting better and better and better um, at forecasting. So this is a company called Descartes Labs um, in the US, uh, although they operate globally. I don't think they've got a product in Australia yet. Uh, they use imagery to predict uh, crop units. And their tool now, which is free, anyone can go on there and have a look. Yeah, there's a subscription service which gives you more detail or finer detail down at a county level um, in the US, but at a, you know, a, a more aggregated level, you can go on there and have a look. They forecast the US corn yield every three days, and they are now much more accurate than the USDA survey, which sets people out on foot, you know, counting corn, bogs, measuring all the corn all together. So, the information and, and the, the way they do that, and I'll just throw this up because it is actually really, I think, quite a, a good slide in terms of explaining a whole lot of the, you know, the digital processes and the way they're put together. So that their inputs are imagery, weather, prices, uh, sentiment, grass sentiment, because they also you know, they start forecasting early, so things like you know, the, the, the sentiment index is about uh, business confidence for farmers, they're saying to incorporate that, and what's the likely intentions of planting and so on. Um, before the crop's even planted, but then when, once the imagery starts coming in, they use that as well. Uh, they ingest all that data, they normalise it, they clean it, um, and then they end up with some data libraries, which um, to get turned into, into a database. Um, and then they have all sorts of analytics running over the top of that, and then they output um, a whole lot of stuff, historical averages, ongoing monitoring, forecasts, and so on. Now, in the past, obviously, those USDA forecasts, um, as we all know, uh, you know <laughs> they'd have huge implications on um, price movements in um, Chicago in, in particular. Um, How is that going to be impacted by these sorts of forecasting technologies? It's going to be quite disruptive. We shouldn't be able to be more. Now, um, what's that going to mean in terms of your ability to trade uh, on futures markets using these sorts of information. I don't think I'm not discussing a number as to how it's going to impact, but it is going to impact in some way or another. Particularly if we start to move to uh, a blockchain approach like Bitcoin for grain trade on futures markets. So, you know, the, the futures markets are in Chicago, even when you buy a futures contract, it's in Chicago, it's on a card base. The potential to, to change that to instantaneous databases all in this sort of really detailed information about what the, the global yields on, uh, on crops are going to be. Um, I don't know. I, it, you know it, it, I know that it's going to have an impact, and I know that um, you know, potentially, again, in terms of comparing the agronomic impact versus the... the um, so you can use this technology to forecast the yield of your crop, which might make an impact on the amount of fertiliser you put on. But is that going to be more or less value to you than being able to really accurately hedge your crop on a future market? I think probably the latter is going to have more of an impact. Um, how are we going to talk? Right, okay. Now, I'm going to finish with some aviation disasters. <laughs> so, I'm a farmer at heart, and there's a lot of art to um, and there's nothing a lot more than, than getting out and you know, picking out the soil and smelling it and just 
getting mildly burdensome. Um, a lot of these technologies sort of take, at first glance, take away a lot of the romanticism of farming. You know, it's all fairly data driven, as I've talked about, and um, you know, potentially at that one end of data and agriculture, you've got something like the poultry industry, which is, you know, well, apart from the free range that we heard about earlier, but the, you know, the, the, the more sort of intensive poultry industries, it's, it's, it's completely data driven. Um, uh, there's very little room for, for art in there. Um, I'm not a pessimist uh, about the uh, removal of human input um, from farming as data becomes um, more pervasive or more important in, in how we farm. And I think these these two aviation, or one's potential disaster, one was a disaster, uh, examples really uh, you know, paint story why. So, um, Air France 447 um, uh, in 2009 um, was flying from Rio to Paris and very tragically crashed into uh, the Atlantic Ocean and all 228 people on board were killed. Um, the reason the crash was the uh, pitot tubes, which measure airspeed, um, blocked up with ice and gave very confusing and contradictory signals on airspeed. Uh, it also shut down the autopilot as a result. Now the pilots just got so fixated on the data that was coming in, erroneous data, confusing data, <coughs> that they just, for some reason, didn't revert to basic training, basic flying skills. They were just fixated on this data. And they didn't actually even realise, they, the first thing they did was increase altitude, they got into a stall, and then they were just going down and down and down, and then they crashed in the ocean. And they just spent the whole time fixing on the sail, they didn't realise that was happening until the very last minute when it was too late. And the last words of one of the pilots was, I just don't understand what is happening. Because they hadn't reverted to those basic skills, you know, the, the human element, to take over the plane and fly the bloody thing. QF32 on the, on the other hand, um, the uh, you know, very famous um, incident with the Qantas plane taking off from Singapore, a turbine disc in one of the engines uh, exploded just after takeoff, uh, sent shrapnel flying right through the fuselage and the wings, um, only one of the remaining engines was functional, uh, the hydraulic systems failed, most of the electronic systems failed, um, rendering the plane basically unflyable from a data, automatic sort of data or a pilot point of view. But the captain um, had made a point uh, of before every single flight with his crew, whenever they travelled uh, from the hotel to the, to, uh, the airport and onto the plane, of running through scenarios, real life scenarios, talking about it, and when his co-pilots would respond, he always made them respond with, with how they would do it without data. Mm -hmm. How they would just take over the plane and fly it manually. Mm -hmm. And so when this happened, mm -hmm. they didn't panic, they didn't like the air frame pilots, they didn't just get fixated on the fact that they had no data and they couldn't do anything. They just flew the plane. And they did manual calculations and they reverted to basic skills in the art of flying the plane and landed it and everyone knew. So I think that there is always going to be uh, not just the, um, you know, the, the, there will be necessity for uh, the human input, even though we're going to more, you know, data is going to be a fantastic tool and it's going to help us be more profitable in our but at the end of the day, farming will still be an art and that will be one of the Thank you.